appreciate Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as uh, more come in, I, I do want to start on time. Um, this is going to be a, a full on, full engaging um, meeting webinar. And, and I do say meeting because uh, as the Zoom has it as a meeting, you will be asking your questions through the chat, not a Q and A. Um, so please in the chat, uh, start off by um, introducing yourself. Say hello with your name and organization. Um, and um, and then ask questions along the way uh, through the chat. I'll be mon I'll be helping Ashley monitor the uh, chat, and um, we'll get to some of the questions along the way. Others will hopefully be have some time at the end to answer some more questions, uh, and maybe even allow people to unmute themselves and and go ahead and ask that way as well. Uh, my name is Michael Matos. I'm the Education Technology Director for Chicago Citywide Literacy Coalition. And this is our first Lab Notes um, professional development opportunity for the year. Uh, we have six of these scheduled up until the end of June. Um, last year, we had four of these that were well received. Um, and uh, we continued this this year. Um, it is part of our Illinois Digital Learning Lab project. So this is basically lessons learned from that project. And I'd, I'd like to give um, a, a tremendous uh, shout out to uh, the organization I work for and their help to have this project, this uh, Illinois Digital Learning Lab, which it, it, I believe has uh, just been a, a great feature out of our state. And if you can please mute yourselves um, until possibly later, that would be great. Um, that way I don't have to do it. Um, and then, um, so I'd like to thank um, Chicago Citywide Literacy Coalition for facilitating and managing um, this great opportunity that is the Illinois Digital Learning Lab and these lab notes series that has come out of that. And also thank uh, the, the Grand Victoria Foundation for their support um, in this project as well. Um, I would like to get right to the point here, introduce you to building an engaging classroom uh, to keep them coming back. And uh, Ashley Winkle is here. Um, she is the Distance Education Call Center Manager at Texas Center for the Advancement of Literacy and Learning uh, at Texas A&M University. And it's a pleasure to have Ashley here today. Um, and Ashley, are you ready? I'm gonna stop sharing and, and give you a uh, command here of the screen. Yes, give me one second. And thank you all very much. Uh, please um, introduce yourself in the chat. That way you know where that's at. So you can ask me some questions uh, along the way. And uh, once again, thank you all for being here and on with the show. Thank you, Ashley. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, just real quick introduction, he pretty much just introduced me, um, but um, my name is Ashley Winkle. I do work for T-Call at Texas A&M. Um, the manager of distance education position is literally just became mine about a month ago. So it's very, very new because we're starting a new distance education call center, which is insane, um, but exciting. Uh, so we're excited. Um, hopefully you'll be hearing more about that in the upcoming months. Um, I am also a journeyman to technology coach, uh, but, but previous to that, um, I was a teacher for uh, adult ed. I was an HSE teacher. I taught ABE. I was also a distance learning teacher and a coach. And I did a lot of trainings, but the biggest thing that I did was I integrated technology and helped other teachers to integrate technology as well. And that was way before the pandemic started. Um, the pandemic was as much of a nightmare for me as it was for everybody else. If that's a relief to anybody, I don't know. But um, I like to tell the story that my experience with it was, oh my God, they're on cell phones. Uh, so I was used to, I was a spoiled teacher. I had a computer lab. We had big screens and I had students that were tech savvy because that's how we made them. Um, but when the pandemic started, I, I had it, my eyes were open greatly as well. Um, so when I created this particular training, um, it was more meant for getting people um, how to engage in a remote environment. But 
now I feel like we've all pretty much gotten to that point, but now we need to think on both on both levels because just because we're no longer, you know, some of us anyhow might not have to continue to be just remote. We still want to keep engaging classrooms, and so we do that. Um, one of the ways we can do that is with technology, of course. So the first thing we're going to do, like Mike, Michael said, this is going to be a pretty engaging um, session. Uh, so right off the bat, we're going to do a little activity using a tool called Slido. I will drop the link into the chat in just a second. Or you can simply go to slido.com um, or you can scan this QR code. Let me just find my chat here. I always, oh, there it is. Okay. Hopefully that works. I'm sure Tiffany will let me know if it doesn't, but it should work. Yeah. Once you go to slido.com or scan your QR code, yay, I'm always happy when my technology works during a technology training, which trust me, it doesn't sometimes, which is always fun too. Once you go there, you're going to see a question appear in just a minute. And you guys are already answering, so, which is awesome. So your first question on Slido is, what is your role in adult education? You can check all that apply on that. Um, looks like mostly instructors, some distance learning, leadership, coach, career navigator. So awesome. We've got a little bit of everything. I'm going to give it a few more minutes. And if anybody has any problems, just let us know. Or also, if you are just absolutely like, I don't want to, <laughs> that's okay too. If you want to enter some of your answers in the chat as we look at some of this technology, that's okay too. We're not here to stress you out today. We're here to have some fun. Um, but this does help me just to get an idea of who I've got in the room today. Some supports us. So we literally have a little bit of everything. You'll notice on Slido, I can see how many people have answered um, as we're going. Um, Slido is not one of the tools that I'm highlighting today, but I do like to use it because it's one of the newer ones I've found this year and it's super easy and I like easy. Easy is good. Uh, second question, we're going to go to what are your favorite tools or strategies for engaging students during your remote and or face to face classes? They do not have to be. Um, it does not have to be technology. It can be whatever you think works great for you. I think on that one, you'll just type it in. Is there nowhere to submit the response? Uh, it looks like some people are. If you can't see it, that's OK. You can type your answers in the chat as well. Uh, let's see, we've got Kahoot's internet. <laughs> yes. Um, quizzes, Quizlet, games, polls, lots of Kahoot, Nearpod, quizzes. Oh, funny. A lot of you know quizzes. That's one of them we're going to be talking about today. That's okay. Uh, let's say Nearpod, yay, groups, students call on each other, Google Slides, open discussion, polls, breakout rooms, jam boards. Yes, love it all. Fantastic. Interactive tasks. Um, so the bigger ones are the ones that are getting the most answers. So that's helpful to me to know about quizzes. So hopefully I don't bore you too much today. Uh, third question is, which of the following ed tech tools have you used with your students? Um, your options are Answer Garden, Ed Puzzle, or quizzes. Or none of the above. Sorry, I forgot about that one. Okay, looks like about half of you said none of the above. Quite a few of you have used quizzes, which makes me happy because that is definitely in my top five. Um, and Ed Puzzle, a couple of people, and nobody for Answer Garden. All right. Well, that gives me a pretty good idea of what we got there. Um, I would highly recommend, um, if you haven't, if you're looking for a new engaging tool to use with your students, check out slido.com. Um, 
They have, uh, it's a pretty easy one to use. It's similar, it reminds me of Mentimeter if anybody's used that one. Um, it's a collaborative tool, not quite as fancy, but they have a nice free version that's easy to respond to and easy to use with your students in or out of class. All right, so today our objective is just gonna be to understand how to effectively build community and utilize tools that will not only help you engage students during online and face-to-face -face instruction, but also retain them so they keep coming back. Because I just find personally, I don't know about anybody else, but a, an engaged student is a happy student. Um, and during the pandemic, while the rest of our teachers at the program I worked for, well, they were really struggling with their attendance. Mine was great, um, but you know, we got them comfortable, we kept them engaged, and we they knew that we cared. I mean, I think that was really the big part of it. So as we're going through this session, what I would like you to do is just kind of to yourself, kind of think to yourself, how can your program use at least one best practice and or technology tool to engage students and help build a solid community? The biggest thing with technology trainings is try to take one thing away. Um, you're, we're gonna be looking at three tools. We've already looked at an additional tool, um, but we're gonna look a little bit more deeply at three particular tools today. One of them, it sounds like a lot of you already know. Um, if you don't like tech or you're not super comfortable, don't get overwhelmed. Just, you know, just take it in. And like I said, we can always differentiate. And if you don't wanna, you know, get your hands on the tool that we're doing, that's okay. Just go ahead and answer in the chat. So our first tool that we're going to look at is Answer Garden. And uh, what I'd like you to do is first to look at the picture on the right. And basically, I want you to make observations. Hold on, let me grab the link for you first. Make observations about what you see. Um, so just think of, you know, keywords you see or descriptive words of what you see in the picture and then go to this link that I just dropped in the chat for you, or if you're using, you have a cell phone in front of you, you can go ahead and scan that QR code and just use descriptive words. You don't want it, nothing crazy. You don't want sentences, just descriptive words because you only have 40 characters that you can use on Answer Garden. So it's just quick and simple and to the point. We'll give you a couple minutes. All right, so I'm gonna show you what I'm seeing coming in as you guys start to answer based on that. Uh, interested, collaboration, teamwork, um, watching something on the computer. Don't know if they might be watching, yes, okay. Anything else? Um, engage students. Exactly. Uh, observation, attention. All men. <laughs> They're not all men. Intense. No, she's a girl and she's a girl. <laughs> um, they're just not in their best clothes, probably. Uh, okay, watch us engage. Okay, so exactly. So this is really what we want in a face to face, at least, environment. Um, this was my class. This was an HSE class. They were working on. You know, they're using technology, but they weren't just out there on their own. That's a lot of times what people envision, right? So this was actually a, a lesson they were doing. It was a collaborative reading lesson. It was not easy. It was hurting their brains because it was a, about a speech. And it was a hyperdoc, which is basically an interactive lesson that they were working on, but they were able to work on it together. I had to capture them because nobody's on their cell phone, which always makes me happy. Um, sorry. Yeah, I just brought that up, Joanne. I just saw that. Um, so anyway, the answer garden is really what the point of this is, though. Um, collaboration tools is our first one that I kind of want to talk about, because that's what answer garden is. We've actually just touched two collaboration tools. One was the Slido and now answer garden. Now, when I chose the tools that I chose today, I try to focus on three levels, really two levels. I wanted to pick something that was easiest. <laughs> In fact, so easy that if I was brand new to technology, I could go and use this right now because, and that's Answer Garden. Um, it's not a fancy tool. As you could see, a better tool would probably be Mentimeter because you could add the picture directly to it, but we don't always need it to be fancy to get to what we wanna do. So Answer Garden is basically, it's an easy to use quick feedback tool delivered through word clouds where submissions are received in real time 
the larger fonts indicate the most frequent responses. There's downsides and there's good sides to this. Um, you might compare it to something like a Padlet, Mentimeter, things like that. Basically, it's just going to make a word cloud for you. Um, but the downside is I tried to do this with 160 participants last year, and well, it didn't do well <laughs> because it, it wasn't equipped for that. Uh, the other thing is you can't really type in sentences. You only have up to 40 characters. So it is good for some things, but you know we need to use our tools for what works best in our lessons. Um, so with that in mind, just I want to talk about some activities that might be considered for this. Uh, you, it would be great for an icebreaker, polls, assessment checks, especially during remote learning, um, brainstorming, breakout rooms or group work, or even to activate prior knowledge just to kind of see what do they already know. Some integration activities uh, or how I might integrate it into my instruction would be for difficult math concepts, uh, share synonyms for vocabulary words, jobs that use fractions, or here is an actual example of how I used it with <coughs> adjectives. I had the students look at this image and I had it on the board um, and they were to think of one to three adjectives that describe the picture above and add it to our answer garden. Now, the nice thing about something like this is I could do this in or out of class. I could even, you know, depending on what tools you use, I could even use this in a digital lesson and they could answer it and they could still answer on the same answer garden regardless. So whether I'm doing an in-class, which in this case, this was a lower level class, and so and it was a smaller class so we did this in class but you could tell you know this is a pretty big word but they had just learned this word so this gave them an opportunity to kind of get their ideas and then we also had an opportunity to kind of go well hey are all these actually adjectives you know so there's a lot of teachable moments as well uh, my slide went the wrong place um okay moving on so with collaborative ideas and tools in mind, um, some examples of what I'm talking about, and I'm sure a lot of you, it sounds like a lot of you have some uh, experience with technology. So what we're talking about is, are tools like Padlet, Mentimeter, Slido, Wakelet, Answer Garden, Google Workspace, Google anything is definitely a, the most amazing collaborative tool in my opinion out there. Um, Google Jamboard, another one of my personal favorites. Uh, reasons to use collaborative tools. And then I'm, I'll look at Tiffany's comment. Students can work together or share ideas together. Each student is able to participate and have a voice. That to me has always been the biggest, most important reason for me to use technology in and out of the classroom. Um, I've been using technology since I started teaching and that's the reason because I always had that student in the back of the room hiding in the corner and I couldn't see and I couldn't assess what he was understand he or she was understanding and also sometimes they're just too shy to participate well this way they don't have to open you know they don't have to be embarrassed their name is not on anything and they have an opportunity to participate with everyone else um, students can learn from one another and the biggest reason, of course, is just student engagement. The more that they're involved in the lesson, the better and stronger um, they are going to be as a student. Tiffany said, that's a good idea for an ESL lesson. Tell me about the picture and use Answer Garden to submit their answers. <laughs> she also says she loves Jamboard, Wakelet, and anything Google. Yes, Tiffany, Tiffany and I know each other. We have a lot of things in common with technology. All right, I'm going to pause for a second. I didn't see any questions. I just wanted to stop and see and feel free to ask questions or make comments or share your ideas or your favorites as well. Um, but if there aren't any, we'll keep going. Uh, what if your learners have low technology skills? Excellent question, Marsha. So that's going to be a training process because all of the students I had did have low technology skills in the beginning. Um, and the hardest time is always in the beginning when you first start with technology and a group of students with no technology skills. So that's where you have to start one tool at a time. And that's it. Like I would just do 
something as simple as an answer garden. And that would be the only technology we really did that day. You know, you kind of want to ease into it and nothing crazy, but you know, eventually what happens is like what that led to, I ended up getting a learning management system. I ended up using in the end, I mostly used Google Classroom, but I tried them all. But Google Classroom was something that kind of got my students set up where every day they'd walk in, they knew in time, didn't happen automatically. They knew to go to Google Classroom. They knew that their assignment was right there, what they needed to start working on. But that was something that became a consistent. And once it became consistent and, you know, it took a while. I'm not going to say it didn't. I still had that student that, you know, six months later, she was still forgetting her password. So it's going to happen and you have to be patient. But the biggest thing is don't ever overwhelm them with tools. Now, of course, I'm thinking in a face to face environment. And I know what a nightmare it is in remote, which makes it even harder, in my opinion. If you have somebody remote who comes in and they already don't have good tech skills, that makes it more challenging. You may have to differentiate in that situation. You kind of heard me say a couple of times, hey, if you're not comfortable or you just don't want to, go ahead and you know type your answers in the chat. Sometimes that's what has to be done until we can get them comfortable. Sometimes that means we have to pull them before class and maybe get on a breakout session with them or if possible meet with them face to face to kind of ease them into it but the biggest thing is to me in my opinion is the consistency of it don't stop doing it um just keep doing it and you know a lot of times what happened in my classes is that the stronger students who've been around for a while they love to share their skills so they would go and help me by helping those students out or what, sometimes I just pair them with another student who might have a little bit stronger skills until they develop those skills as well. All right, anything else? I don't think I missed anything. Okay, we're gonna keep going. So uh, next category we're gonna look at is practice and assessment. So this time we're going to look at Edpuzzle. I did see that some people had some experience with Edpuzzle. Give me a moment, I will get you a link to throw into the chat. Um, Edpuzzle is another one of my top five for sure. That did not give me a live link. Hold on a second. Oh, sometimes Zoom and I don't get along. <laughs> All right, go ahead and click on that and let me know if that works and what you see. Once you go on there, you will click on join open class. And again, if you don't want to participate, that's okay. I would just ask as the questions come in, you can ask if I'm a teacher or a student. One moment. Say that, Tiffany, do me a favor, say that you're a student. Some people are getting in okay, so. Um, if it asks for a, does, is it a class code? If it's a class code, it should be this. Huh, some people, are, okay. The other option you can do is this. Go to edpuzzle.com. Let me drop this in instead. Go to edpuzzle.com. Once you go there, it should give you an option to enter a code. Yes, open classroom. Code is, whoops, I put that in, N-A-V-Z-A-M-P, NAVZAMP. And sometimes, like right now, technology doesn't go smooth sailing, <laughs> especially when you do this remote. I'm going to tell you the way we're doing this right now is so much more fun face to face. But, you know, a lot of us don't have that option right now. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and start. Like I said, if you want, you can just answer in the chat um, or just follow along with us. Um, so this is a live session with Edpuzzle. And if you don't know what Edpuzzle is, uh, yes, you're waiting on me, Joanne. That's perfect. I'm about to start. But if you don't know what Edpuzzle is, Edpuzzle is interactive video lessons. And you can create your own. There's tons of them already made for you. 
but it really allows for a more engaging video lesson with your students. So we're gonna learn a little bit about that right now. Do you want to create amazing video lessons in minutes? Edpuzzle is your missing piece. In Edpuzzle, you can find wonderful educational videos from YouTube, LearnZillion, Khan Academy, Vimeo, or even reuse video lessons from other teachers or upload your own. Okay, first question is, what sources can you add videos from on Edpuzzle? I want to check, I don't, it's out of order apparently, but I think the, all of the above is supposed to be on the bottom. So you will answer from your device. And down here, what I can see is how many people have answered so far. It's like so far we've got seven. Just another minute or so. All right, looks like about nine of you answered. So I'm going to go ahead and continue for the sake of time. The answer should have been all of the above. Now it is out of order for some reason. That's my fault. I didn't check on that first. But the nice thing is now I can look at the responses um to see if everybody got it right or how the how the class did as a whole if there's something we need to go back and review anything like that then you can make the perfect lesson using edpuzzle editing tool you can trim a video and take only what you need for your lesson you can also Okay, next question is, one cool feature of Edpuzzle is being able to trim the video. You don't have to use the entire thing. Oh, Tiffany just told me that it was playing in the Zoom window with the questions on another window. Is anybody else having a problem with that? Not sure, Tiffany, about that. Um, I have not done this that, yes, I can't access the question. Okay, well, if you can't, that's okay. We will just modify as we do and just answer in the chat instead if you need to. Watching on one screen and answering on another. All right, well, that's good to know, um, especially in this environment. I only tried to do this a couple times this way. I usually, I'll tell you how I used, used to do it with my students. Same for me, okay. All right, um, answer should have been true. Uh, you can actually trim videos, which is very useful, especially if you are using somebody from K through 12's video and they've added stuff that has K through 12 elements on it because you can edit it so that you can take those things out. Like sometimes I'll pull one up and it says, hey kiddos, and I really don't want to show my adult students that. So you can take those things out here. Yeah, also, so feel free just to answer the chat. To make a warm introduction or explain with your own words. Finally, you can... All right, true or false. You can just drop it into the chat. Edpuzzle even lets you record your own voice. Is this true or false? True, all right. You can embed questions during the video to check the understanding of your students. In minutes, you created the perfect lesson, and in just one click, you can assign it to your students. Okay, next question. Questions can be added throughout your videos just like these. True or false? These are tough questions, I know. That is true. You can add your own, you can delete them, you can edit them. And you can just add comments or you can add links if you want to. Edpuzzle provides you all the information you need. Who hasn't watched the video? Who doesn't understand the lesson? And who did a good job? Remember. 
So with that puzzle, you can see who watched the video, how much time they spent watching it, and the grade they received on it. True or false? You like the easy questions. Yeah, in trainings, you have to do easy questions. <laughs> this is all true. So they give you a nice um, data set at the end where you can see your classes. Remember, in that puzzle, you can find amazing educational videos. Make the perfect lesson in minutes and track your students with hassle-free analytics. With that puzzle, you can make any video your lesson. Okay, so that was an overview of Edpuzzle. Um, we did learn today that maybe we don't want to do it that way in a remote environment. I have only tried it a few times in remote. I really prefer to use it like that in the live mode when it's a face-to-face -face class because they can answer directly from their devices and then we can discuss together. Do you use this during your live classes or can you post it on a good question, Joanne? So you can use Edpuzzle and I'm gonna go over that in a second in a lot of different ways, but you saw what we ended up doing. A lot of times when I was in a remote environment, what we would do is we would do the Edpuzzle together, the teacher would. I would just put their answers in as they answered in the chat because, you know, the limitations. You guys saw the limitations with two screens. Well, they're only on a cell phone. So that didn't work. But what you can do is you they can do this independently. You can assign it as homework. And when you do that, they can have their own ed puzzles and they don't and they, it connects really nicely with Google Classroom also. But the other nice thing is they have a really good app. So um, your students can do it that way. What I really like about it, I used to put it on Google Classroom, um, things like that. You could also do it. Well, let me get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself before the slide, but we'll cover all of that in a moment. Home fun. <laughs> yes, home fun. That's exactly what it is, not homework. Um, but just a quick overview, and then we'll get into that a little bit, is Edpuzzle is an easy-to-use assessment-centered platform that allows teachers and students to create and use interactive online videos by embedding open-ended or multiple-choice questions, audio notes, audio tracks, or comments on videos. So activities. I think I used to use Edpuzzle for every single lesson I ever did. Um, it was just my favorite go to, uh, but it's great as a warm up or a hook uh, background information I use that countlessly, especially when we were trying to read like a speech or something like that. Um, because it would turn out my students didn't know what the Bay of Pigs was so I would go and pull an Ed puzzle video to kind of give them some of that background information to help them understand the text uh, is a great assessment tool. Wonderful for the idea of a flipped classroom. So where you would assign it first so that they could go get that um, background information ahead of class and then come to school the next day and then you could go on with your lesson. And then, of course, as independent practice or homework, I have used it for I mean, when the GED calculator first came around and we were all well, at least I was panicking a little bit. I found a series of videos on it and I turned those videos into Ed Puzzle videos so that we could stop. We had the calculator in our hands. We could stop and we could make sure we knew how to do each thing as we went. It went really, really um, well. Um, some integration examples, and I will show you one. Um, I have used it for lessons on the Electoral College. That was just a couple of years ago. Punnett squares, slope, practice identifying cause and effect. This was amazing. We did this in a remote lesson. Uh, it was amazing because it was so hard. <laughs> like we didn't realize how hard it was, but we would like watch it. We would watch a segment and then we would have to identify what the cause and effect was. And it was a lot harder than it looked and we ended up going through it, but it was great practice. Um, and ESL, that, the first time I saw Ed Puzzle was with uh, Dr. Glenda Rose, and she showed an example of ESL for vocabulary, practice using it for vocabulary. Um, my example here was uh, a digital lesson I did on the Electoral College. I just kind of wanted to show you like where I had it in the lesson. So we had our little warm up that we did vocabulary, then we talked about voting, and then here I was able to um, include Electoral College Ed Puzzle video to help us understand Electoral College a little bit better. Um, so that was one example. So you can use it whenever. I mean, I've had a lot of situations where I'm like, I didn't think of that. They didn't know what something meant. And I'll just grab something. Nice thing about Ed Puzzle is they already have a whole library 
of Ed Puzzles made. So usually I can find something that's already made. And if not, you can grab something off of YouTube and it's pretty easy to learn. Um, it's not super difficult like other things, but not as easy as something like Answer Garden. Uh, okay, I was just gonna see, do you use during your love class? Okay, I think I answered that, Joan. I use it for everything. Uh, it's great also to supplement a distance learning program. So if your students are still struggling with maybe a, a math skill or something like that, you can always refer them to that. I also have one that I did um, a series of them on writing the extended response on the language art or on the RLA. Um, trying to get this word into Webster's home <laughs> fun. Uh, let's see, been using this idea for at least five years now. Join me. Oh, love that. Um, and so our best practice then when we're talking about Edpuzzle is uh, using assessment and practice tools. I really found when remote instruction started, my biggest challenge was figuring out independent work um, when they were on their phones. You know, you know, you can't just hand them a piece of paper. You know, it was just everything was just more complicated because I was used to being them being on a computer where they could type and you know that sort of a thing. And them being on their phones, I really had to look for tools that worked well on their phones. And these are some of them that I think are the best, in my opinion, were best for me. Let me rephrase. There's so many tools out there. Um, there is one called Formative that I still swear by. It is an amazing assessment tool, and it does so many things and if you can do nothing else, I would just go on YouTube and check it out. Um, that was my favorite one because it's made for a cell phone. Nearpod, same thing, Top one of my top tools. I learned more about it from Tiffany Lee, actually. Um, Google Forms, Edpuzzle, Hyperdocs using a tool like WaitClick. I was trying to pick things. If you don't know what a Hyperdoc is, it's basically their digital lesson. Instead of having like a lesson plan where it's all over the place, it's all in one place. It can be done in or out of class, but the student can be with you or without you. But that's an, another a session all on its own. So we're not gonna get too into that right now. Reasons to use these tools. Students can access these tools easily from any device that has become so incredibly important to us over the last two years. Teachers use for in-class purposes. And tools can be used in and out of class for assessment checks, independent practice, or flipped learning. These are all just great to use. I think we've really noticed that. It was kind of hard doing paper and pen when we we're in a remote environment, but I don't think we need to just go back to just paper and pen again. I think we should be trying these other things because it really helps us not only have engaging lessons, but also we're teaching our students those digital skills as we're doing them. All right, looks like we're okay in the chat, so I'm going to keep going. And like I said, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to throw them in there. Um, and then, of course, everybody's favorite game-based learning. Uh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have to be digital games are the best, I think, uh, for learning and just having fun and keeping your students coming back. Uh, quizzes. So I think this is the one that everyone already knows about. So just see this as like a review and have a little fun with it. Um, so it's a free student pays formative assessment tool that is a fun and engaging alternative to Kahoot that can be done in or out of class. Um, and they've changed so drastically just in such a short period of time and they're still and they just keep getting better and better. I think they were one of my first tools that I used. I've been training on it for years. Um, it's just I use it in so many different ways and the students love it. I mean, I have sent it like on my distance learning group, I have sent quizzes out to students for some GED practice. Um, I've, I've done all sorts of, my students used to ask me for homework prep, they wanted to practice their grammar and stuff like that. So they'd ask me to assign the quizzes because it works so nicely on the phone. But then what I like about using tools like quizzes also, like Quizlet and things like that is that they, again, have a great app and they can go find their own to practice on and they can do it straight from their phone. Um, activities you might consider pre-assessment, post-assessment, formative assessment while they're learning, um, independent practice in class practice or homework or wait, home fun. That This is definitely a home fun situation. Um, oh, Marsha hasn't used it. Okay, at least there's one person who hasn't used it. You'll have an opportunity today, Marsha. Um, integration examples, these were real. When I say integration examples, these are ones I actually did. That's why they're so specific. Uh, one of them was the coronavirus. I'll show that when it first came out, I created a digital lesson about coronavirus and cleaning. 
um, fractions, vocabulary, impeachment, GED test prep, applying reading skills to HSE test post tests. Um, there's been, I've used it again, it's one of those that I used so often um, along with Edpuzzle. But this is an example of the uh, coronavirus lesson that I created right when the pandemic started, in which I know we're also sick of even hearing about it at this point. Um, but it's one of the first ones I created. I mean, I'm still calling it coronavirus 2019, so that tells you how old that is. But, you know, we've got a, a janitorial cleaning tip. So I took a lesson and basically I made it digital. You know, we started with the KWL chart, but we ended with a quizzes. And the reason I chose quizzes was because I knew that of any tool, this was the only part I had them do independently. You don't have to have them do it independently. You can do it as a group as well, kind of like what we did with Edpuzzle. But I knew my students could handle it. So with my students, we actually had two classes combined. The other girls, my other teacher, her students couldn't do it. So, but mine could because they already had some tech skills. So that's the only one I did independently. But again, I use this as basically a post-assessment tool um, to see how they did and their learning. But you'll notice in this lesson, and I did drop the lesson in the chat in case you just wanna look at it or anything, that I use all the tools that I just talked about quite a bit. So I tended to use Edpuzzle a lot in these um, remote environments. And it was pretty funny. I mean, I think now it's pretty funny because I was a tech coach. So people always have higher expectations of my skills in a remote classroom. Well, I couldn't even figure out why the students couldn't hear the video. <laughs> so I put an Edpuzzle on and the students are like, we can't hear. And then they got real creative of ways that we can make them hear it because I didn't know you were supposed to share your sound. So that's how inexperienced I was at that time with Zoom, uh, how far we have all come. Um, best practices. This time we're talking about use game-based tools. Examples are Kahoot, Quizlet Live, iCivics, if you are a social studies teacher, that is a pretty fun one. Jeopardy, Gym Kit is one I've dabbled with, but not really done anything with. Um, quizzes, Nearpod has a game element to it. Mentimeter, I didn't even know until I attended a session about two months ago, has a game aspect to it too, which is super fun. Um, and Vocab Jam on vocabulary.com, that's that can be a lot of fun too, a little challenging. Uh, reasons to use games. Pretty obvious, but we'll go ahead and talk. Oh yeah, Quizla is Michael. I haven't used that one in a long time. Um, it's fun, which means students are engaged. Good assessment check. Opportunity to build community in and out of the classrooms. I always used to worry about my distance learning students because they were out there on their own, not having the fun we were having in class. So I would try to find things that they could do to participate as well. And students have a new tool to use for their own practice. Um, a lot of these tools, vocabulary.com, uh, Quizlet, Kahoot even now has an app, and quizzes, they all have these great apps where the students can go and search and find their own practice to do, which is always a bonus to me when I can get them finding another way to study. So let's go ahead. You should all be pros at this almost. Um, and we're going to play quizzes. Let me just pull this up and I'll drop the link in there for you. I don't know if that's right, hold on. Otherwise you can go to joinmyquiz.com. Well, that looks like a really long link, but if somebody could click on it and tell me if that works. Otherwise, I'll say go to joinmyquiz.com. Yay, I like it when things work. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So once you're in there, um, you will enter the code 28342449. You will enter your name and click on start. And you can start right away. You're not waiting for anybody else. Maybe I can set it up that way.
Yes, that's a good idea, Michael. He said, to really get the student experience, you could snap the QR code on your mobile phone. Looks like Angel has completed. We'll give everybody else about three more minutes. Okay, I think everybody is done. I don't want to cut anybody off. All right. If not, you can keep playing, but I think everybody's done. I didn't have too many questions on there. Um, just a couple of things. So this is just kind of a fun way to, you know, engage your students. Um, sometimes students are going to struggle to play on their own, so you do want to be ready to help them or play together or let them participate in another way. Uh, I know that I had a group of ABE students, they were actually like really just out of ESL level students. And um, <laughs> Marsha, your phone is a yeah, I understand. <laughs> um but you know they came in they didn't come in with any technology skills so what we would do i would have to like actually walk around the class and like help them do it but we'd also do it together after they were done we'd also do it together um in a remote environment if you don't feel your students already they do have a presentation that you can do and you don't have to be timed there's so many differentiation opportunities with quizzes which is what i really like about it um so they, it doesn't have to be time. You can extend the time or you can get rid of the time altogether if that's too intimidating for your students. So there's a lot to do. And again, this is one of those tools that I love because there's so many already made. Um, I always say, but do, you know, be a little bit careful and make sure you read through to make sure the answers are correct because you have to keep in mind that teachers made those and they're people. So they may have made a mistake, just like Kahoot, that happens a lot as well. But I have almost never found anything I, that I couldn't find um, when I've looked in the quizzes library. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, to talk a little bit more about engage them to retain them, just some examples of things that um, we were doing, uh, especially when the pandemic started, but we were kind of doing it before too, because we were trying to really, uh, our focus was on online learners. Um, especially with the distance learning learners, I was always so concerned about them um, because they just didn't have the support. Um, but thanks, Gretchen, thank you for joining. Um, but we would do things like weekly leadership boards and specifically for distance learning users, we were trying to get our, uh, you know, our all of our students to use. So we started doing, you know, top performers. Um, and it was surprising how much they did it more because they wanted to see their name on that board. Uh, at this time, we were in a remote environment. We found that team teaching was incredibly effective because the students had two people to care about them, not just one. I know that's not an ideal situation, but it was nice to have that opportunity while we did. Um, personalization and motivation in and out of class. We, you know, we did a show and tell, which I thought was going to be ridiculous because I thought it was too childish. I was totally wrong. It was fascinating. They, there were birds and there were, 
you know, gardens were shown and it was a lot of fun. Um, and I always try to send something motivational once or twice a week on our Remind app. Um, recognition and announcements, always try to make sure that we recognize successes, especially somebody passed one of their tests today, that sort of thing. Um, we'd make an announcement and we'd, when we'd make the announcement, we did it online. We tried to, you know, we used Remind, the Remind app. Other people use WhatsApp or I'm sure there's something else. Um, but we used to always try to personalize things as much as possible to keep, you know, so they knew that we're still people and they remember what our faces look like. Um, we also tried to create timely and relevant lessons and discussion topics. And these were just some examples of the lessons that we were doing when the pandemic first started. Um, this is an why is there, these were all taken from, well, this was taken from Actively Learn, which is my favorite reading tool because it's very interactive and engaging. So if you haven't seen that one, I'll drop the link in there. Um, but these are the type, but they have very relevant, timely articles. And this one was, why is there too much milk and not enough toilet paper? Okay. Um, you know, a student guide, five tips for online learning. So we tried to have really good, effective. Um, these were, uh, oh, actively learn goes down to, I believe, third grade to 12th, I think. Don't quote me on the third grade. I'm pretty sure it goes to that, though. Um, and they do have a free version that the only downside to it is now is you can only pick like one subject area. So it would be like, I think I did like reading um, versus science or social studies, that sort of thing. But um, it, it's an amazing tool once you start looking at it. I've done a lot of presentations on that. Just some further recommendations, um, questions to ask yourself when you're integrating technology into any instruction. How can I use a tool to make the lesson engaging? Um, don't use a tool just to use it is the, a really big thing that we talk about right now. Don't just use it just for the sake of use. I mean, if you're going to use technology, make sure it has a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, there's no point in doing it. Um, how does the tool help me to meet my objectives? Does my student have the technology to use the tool? This, as we all know, is incredibly important. Because, and you might not have technology in your classroom either. I mean, you have to really, really be thinking about these things when you are planning a lesson. Um, how is it viewed from a mobile device and a computer? Boy, was that a good time when the remote world started. It was like, okay, now let me get on, like we would get on Zoom ahead of time. I'm sure other people went through this too. We get on, what does it look like from my phone? What does it look like on Zoom from my phone? You know, um, so you have to think about both. If you're in a face-to-face, -face, you're going to know what you have more so, but you might be in a face-to-face -face where all you have are mobile devices. So you have to really, really think about these things. And what I like um, is, can I see what the student is doing? And what I mean is, um, there's some of these, some of these you can see what they're doing while they're doing it. Those are my favorite. Formative does that, actively learn does it. I know exactly what they're doing and I can call or Google, Google anything, you can do that. You know, but I can see what they're doing while they're doing it, so I can just comment right on the document, or if I'm in class with them, I can walk over and make sure, you know, let them know, hey, you're not quite doing that the right way. Um, and can you think of others that we might want to consider when choosing technology? Uh, let's see, what level? That would be good for me. I lead a conversation class. I, excellent. Um, if you can think of anything else, uh, other things you might want to consider. There is a lot that does go involved. I mean, get involved with using technology, which is why I think a lot of times teachers are like, eh, I don't want to, you know, and I get that too, but we do have to consider, I do really want to say though, you know, knowing your students' levels, technology levels is really critical. I mean, I had students come in who had never used a mouse before, that low of a level, and I remember the first time that had it, I had a panic attack because I was like, oh God, how do you teach how to use a mouse, you know, and of course there's programs out there but by the end, that same student, and he happened to be uh, a rather old, he was like 78 years old. And that same student ended up becoming a distance learning student, which was just beyond amazing. And he graduated and he got his GED. So, you know, when that quite, when you asked that question earlier, you know, you just, it's baby steps and, you know, hope and patience, <laughs> a lot of patience. Um, just a few further recommendations. Learn and practice using technology with colleagues before class. That's the best. Practice as a student and a teacher on a practice Zoom call. If you're remote, you may even want, if you're not remote, you may want to practice as well. Depends on what the tool is. Trust me, I have practiced on a lot of teachers. 
Uh, try it on a computer and a mobile device. Keep it simple, especially in the beginning. Use one tool and a practice one at a time. Don't do everything all at once because you're going to stress yourself out and you're going to stress your students out and you're all going to want to quit and we don't want that. Keep lessons simple and focused on building relationships with your students. And finally, try to create activities uh, in Zoom. This was, like I said, this was originally specific to, you know, um, online, but try to keep uh, Zoom activities that would replace face-to-face -face activities. And, you know, these days I would say you could go the reverse way as well when, if you are back in the classroom, if you're, a lot of people were doing things on Zoom they never dreamed of doing in the class. Well, maybe there's something you can do. If you can do something in one, you should be able to do it in the other some way. Um, use breakout rooms, group works, welcome mistakes, and most importantly, have fun. Technology is very challenging, but it can be amazing and it can be a lot of fun as well. And I have for you guys today a little resource to take with you um that i will post here in the chat um feel free to you can also feel free to reach out to me if you want to any comments or questions well sometimes if you take something off and you like unplug it then it like burns what was left behind um, so so this hot. is uh, a wakelet I put together for you. It has the um, doc, the resources we looked at today um, with a few additional resources as well. I've also created a little collaboration board if anybody wants to add on to it to some of their favorite text. There is also a copy of the uh, PowerPoint and we're trying to build our Facebook. So if you would like our Facebook, I'd be really happy about that because we just started. <laughs> so. That is it. And yes, you can share this with anybody. I'm a big share. So, and I thank you all. Perfect timing. I'm so impressed. I was scared I wasn't going to make it. You guys have been great. And if there's any other questions, I can stick around for. Yeah, I'd like to open minutes. this up to any questions. Uh, if you could continue to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. My pleasure. Um, yes, Angelique, the presentation is on that wakelet, but I can go ahead and drop it in the chat as well. Give me just a second. If you have any other questions, please unmute yourselves or put it in the chat. Uh, I'd like to thank you all so much for uh, participating in our lab notes uh, and, and thank you, Ashley, for this great presentation and sharing with us. Um, please stay engaged. Uh, these are all our social media uh, sites and handles here. Um, and um, I would like to just quickly promote our next lab notes which is on friday january 28th and i will be advertising some more information on this including the registration link uh so yes uh january 28th 2022 from 1 p.m to 2 p.m uh it's central standard time for those of you uh attending not from the midwest here um and it's uh entitled building data dashboards and google sheets to inform decision making uh, with uh, Joey Learman, and I hope you join us for that one as well. And uh, we'll keep you all posted, as well as I'll be sending out certificates. And this recording and uh, slides will be on our Illinois Digital Learning Lab website, and I will send the link along uh, or the links along with the certificate uh, early next week. One last minute, uh, any other questions for Ashley or for me? Someone asked if she could share with her organization's newsletter. Absolutely, share anything, I love to share. So whatever you wanna give them, you can give them from me anyway. <laughs>
Cool. I didn't even see David in there. Hey, David. Yeah, he's in there. <laughs> Snuck in. I knew he was on the other webinar. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Good. Well, thank you all so much once again for attending. Um, you have a great weekend. And just to remind you that we're out there, uh, you know, especially the Illinois Digital Learning Lab, you know, ultimately our, our goal uh, is to help students and teachers develop uh, those 21st century skills needed for uh, professional and personal um, lives. Um, so please uh, join us on on um, this trip, right? Um, and, and continue to uh, reach out um, and and join these great professional development opportunities. Awesome, thank you. Happy holidays to everybody and thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you, awesome. Have a good holiday, everyone.